We're not, we're not trying to say that everybody makes up their own gospel, that you manipulate scripture, that you twist it to fit what you want it to say or what you think your purpose is or whatever. No, no, there's a truth in the word of God. There's a truth in the foundation of the scripture. But it's, it's going to look a little differently because there's many ways to apply the word of God. And according to the purpose that's in us, we're going to see things a little differently. And some scriptures will call out to us and bring us a, a deeper revelation according to what we're called to do. Now, doctrine. What is doctrine? Why is it so different with everybody? Basically, what doctrine is, doctrine is assembling a bunch of different understandings and belief about Scripture, interpreting Scripture according to the truth, and, and then you're developing, you're bringing enough together to develop a pattern, and this pattern is how we walk out our faith. That's your doctrine. And everybody's going to have a little different doctrine, and as long as it's based on the foundation of Jesus, it's okay. Like I said, we always get in trouble when, you know, the Baptists want to point at the Pentecostals and say, oh, well, you can't pray in tongues. And then the, you know, the, the Pentecostals point at the Baptists and say, well, you're quenching the Holy Spirit, you know, and well, you're going, to, well, you're going, no, well, you're a heretic, you're, you know, it's like, come on, stop it. Come on, do you believe in Jesus Christ and him crucified? Can I get an Amen. 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 And so that's what we need to hold on to. And, and we have to understand we're going to see the, the, the gospel a little differently. And we're, we're not to, to get out there and be um, a, a doctrine police where we start cutting down everybody's doctrine and telling them that because they do it a little differently or, or not like we think they should, that they're wrong. We got to quit doing that. We don't want to do that. Now, on the same note, it's very, very important that all of us see who we are in Christ. That you know the scriptures that resonate to you, the, the scriptures that call you according to your purpose, according to what you're called to do, that you stand strong. Because if you don't stand strong in, in how you see to walk out your doctrine, and, and that's going to be like together, together, what do we do? What does the local church do? The local church assembles different scriptures according to what they feel their purpose is, and then that will form our doctrine, how we walk out together in unity, how we walk out uh, the gospel, how we walk out the truths of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we have to know who we are, because if you're not, what happens is, all of a sudden, you start getting tossed to and fro. Well, you think you're supposed to do this, and then some other preacher says, no, you're not supposed to do it that way. You're supposed to do it this way. So it's like, oh, okay, I'll change. Let's do it. And then another preacher says, no, you don't do it that way. You do it this way. Like, oh, okay, well, we'll do it that way. And then like, you're like, you're, you're not standing strong on anything. And instead of walking by faith, you're all confused, and you're getting tossed to and fro with every little wind of doctrine, it says in Ephesians 4. That's not being mature. Okay, it's almost, you know, you got to be careful. You almost don't come to the point of being double-minded. So it's important that you know who you are in Jesus Christ. As a local body, the call that we have as, as a group, part of our doctrine, we are a spiritual warring church. We have a prophetic gift. We understand the power of praise and worship. We believe in the gifts and the power of the Holy Spirit. We believe in the miracle working power of God in us, effectively working through us to establish the kingdom. That's who we are. And that's what we believe. And that's what we are going to walk out our gospel according to our purpose. And today we're going to understand a little bit more about prophecy. Prophecy is really increasing. As you know, the Bible is one-third prophecy. And why is it important to understand prophecy? We want to understand prophecy because through it, God, God partnered with us. From the very beginning of the foundation of the world, he said, I'm going to partner with man. And man is going to have dominion over the world, but I, I'm going to guide man and speak to him. And Adam and Eve had some issues, as you know. And so, you know, Jesus Christ comes in and, and, and sets us free and, and, and gives us the authority and brings back that relationship with God. But even in the Old Testament, God said that he didn't do anything, God's will. He said, I, God didn't do anything unless he first showed it to his servants, the prophets, first. Why? Because God wanted to bring his partnering, partnering with man. God wanted to bring his will to pass in the earth. And so he would show the the prophets, his servants, what he wants to do. So they would call it forth, speak forth the word of God. And then when they would speak forth the will of God, the angels would also hear and respond to those scriptures, to the word of God, to bring forth God's kingdom and what God wants done on this earth. And it's still the same way today. Until Jesus Christ comes back, we're going to speak the mysteries. We're going to 
speak the prophetic scriptures of what the Lord wants done because we are calling forth the kingdom of God. We're calling forth the rule and reign of Jesus Christ. We're calling forth what the Lord wants to happen because he shows us what he wants. We speak it. We pray it. Angels respond, and together with the angels, we are fighting fighting back that darkness, fighting the kingdom of darkness, and releasing the word of God into this world so it manifests the miracle-working power of God. And prophecy is so important to allow us to help us see what is God doing? What does he want us to do? Well, it's, it's, it's in here. The, the things that we're going to call forth and believe for are, are in Scripture. We're not just going to make something up, okay? We, we have to believe what the Lord's telling us, and then we speak it because words are powerful. Boy, are words powerful. Words are powerful. You know, like, like I, I, I like to share this because it's so interesting. Um, you know how God spoke in the world came into existence. At the very beginning, God spoke the power of words. And it tells us in the scripture that the, by faith we understand that the worlds are formed together by the word of God so that the things that are not seen are formed from the things that are invisible. In other words, this world is created, it's framed together by the word of God. The, 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 the sound waves and everything are so powerful in, in, in understanding, even in science. Now, science will confirm the Bible. And what the scientists are learning now, we, we've showed you this before, there's a scientific word that they have, and it's called gluon. And gluon is the understanding, it's the theory. They're, the scientists today are trying to figure out with how molecules interact and how energy is, what is holding everything together? We can't, we're trying to figure out what is this thing that is, and so they said the glue, the gluon, that's holding, they said it's sound waves. Well, yeah, the Bible said that. The sound waves are the word of God. It holds everything together. Isn't it cool? The more that science learns, the more that they realize that, well, yeah, it's in the Bible. And so words are very, very powerful. So our words have a creative force behind them. When we're praying and releasing what God said, then it has a creative force to create and bring forth the kingdom of God, the rule and reign of Jesus Christ, his love, here into this physical realm. So it's not just only this, this realm that we see. We're bringing forth that power, that authority, the will of God to love people, to break bondages, to set the captives free, that people can know and experience the love, the power of the kingdom. You are walking little kingdoms. Little kingdom, little kingdom, little kingdom, little kingdom, little kingdom. And you have the authority of Jesus Christ in you, little kingdom. At every place you go, you bring that kingdom. Every room you walk into whether it's at work. It's not just here on Sunday. This is where you get filled up. Fill me, Lord! <laughs> this is where you get filled up with that power, with that anointing. And then you're, now you're to bring it out. This is where we get equipped, we get trained, and then you go out there to do where the real work is. God is so good. So we got to be confident who we are in Jesus Christ. Now, for 12 years, we've been being developed as spiritual warriors. We've been a church for 18 years, but we, we came here about 12 years ago in 2007. God changed our name, just didn't change our vision. He fine-tuned our vision, and we've been being developed as spiritual warriors, but even more so in the last five years, I would say, I like to write things down because I want to show you what the Lord is doing to encourage you and know that God's prophetic power is alive and real and it's in each one of you. It's not just me. And more of you are starting to feel it and experiencing it as, as listen, it says that the, the, the latter glory is going to be greater than the first glory. And, and part of that glory is understanding what the Lord is doing. And it's, and it's a prophetic voice from the Holy Spirit. Um, but when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you in all truth. He will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will show you things to come. That's from John. And that's talking about the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth. We want to walk in truth. Sometimes you don't know what to do. What's the right answer? What do I do here? How do I walk this out? How do I handle this situation? Well, you've got the spirit of truth in you the Holy Spirit. 
And he knows what's going to happen before it happens. And so many times he'll show us what's going to happen, and other times he won't, but we just trust in him, knowing that he is the spirit of truth. That is in each and every one of you. And so you know the truth. You know the truth. You know the truth of Scripture. You know the Holy Spirit. It is in you. When something you hear isn't right, whatever, you know, sometimes there's this little alarm. Something goes off that we need to check and see what's going on. But you have the Holy Spirit, and he's going to tell you things to come. That's that gift of prophecy. That's that prophetic gift. How many times have you ever had kind of like a sense that, no, I really think this is going to happen, and you really feel the Lord showing you that, and it happens, okay? It's, it's, it's the Holy Spirit because he's preparing you. Not only that, he wants us to call forth. He partners with us. Our words are powerful. Call forth. Now, on December 26, 2014, this is my little prayer journal. When you ever hear my prayer journal, I buy these little uh, at the dollar store. I love them. They're only a buck. And I buy them at the dollar store. And these are like my little prayer journals. And I fill them up. It takes me, oh, I don't know, about five months, four months maybe to fill this up. And, and, and I, I write in it in my prayer time. And uh, I, I, I write down uh, questions in here. Sometimes, you know, I'll have a question like, well, Lord, why did this happen? Or, or what's going on here, Lord? Or, or how do I respond? So I'll write it down in here. And then I'll pray and I'll wait and see if the Holy Spirit tells me anything or or he might show me a scripture to read, or he'll give me some direction, or he'll just tell me specific things to write down. But now, this is not the infallible word of God. This is the word of Mike. <laughs> okay? This is the infallible word of God. So when I write things down in here, I believe it's spirit-led. I believe it's from the Holy Spirit. But I, I'm not, I, I don't ever, when I refer to my prayer journal, I don't want you to ever think I'm doing it as, thus saith the Lord. Okay? Because it's not. It's thus saith Mike. <laughs> but I believe it's the Holy Spirit inspiring me to write things down. I would encourage you have a prayer journal. This is how, do you, do you want to understand what God's doing in your life prophetically? Do you want to understand what he's doing? You have to see the pattern. What are the, pro why the, the, the prophets, Jeremiah, Isaiah, all these prophets, you know, Micah, all these prophets, they wrote things down. God wanted them to write things down. Why? Because you can develop patterns and you can see things. And then also you write things down so when it does happen, you can say, God goes, see, I already showed you that. Why? Because you got the spirit of prophecy. And when you write it down in advance, it confirms. God's probably showing you all kinds of things in advance and you just forget because you never write it down. And then it comes to pass and you think, oh, that's deja vu. No, the Lord already showed you that a long time ago. It's not deja vu. But you forgot to write it down, so you probably forgot the Lord told you. Prayer journal is good. So, in, in December 26, uh, 2014, in my prayer journal, um, what, five years ago, whatever, something like that, um, this, is, this is what started a huge increase in the prophetic gifting in this, in this church. Um, I wrote this down. I received at Lifesong Church office, I was just here by myself in the office praying, a great revelation to walk out the prophecy of Jesus Christ. The Lord told me to write it down. I feel that way, and that's what I wrote down. And this is why. I was in my office, and I was praying, you know, looking at the year. We're at, you know, 2014 is ending, and some things are happening, and I'm praying, and, and uh, all of a sudden, oh, man, whew, I get this anointing, the anointing of God, this wave upon wave of energy, of infilling, and I'm like, whoa. And, and it only happened to me at this level twice in my life. One, once was years before. And then so I knew with this anointing, I knew that there was an assignment that the Lord wanted. I knew there was something that the Lord wanted us to do. Because the reason why you get anointing, anointing is the power of the Holy Spirit to carry out a specific function of God that you can't do on your own. And you need the power of Holy Spirit in order to walk out what the Lord wants you to do. And that's what the anointing is. And that's what the oil also is representative of. Our little oils that we have, these things that I carry around, bing. There we go. I love it. That's why we anoint people and stuff. That's symbolic of the Holy Spirit, of the anointing. We do things by faith. These rituals have power. They have meaning when we anoint and pray with oil. That's the anointing to help break through whatever you're praying about. Sometimes we need a breakthrough. We need some help. We need that power of the Holy Spirit. And so the oil is just symbolic of faith because the Bible says to do that. So by faith, we anoint with oil and we pray, which is the anointing of the Holy Spirit, which is the power of God to do something. And on that day, I was anointed by the Holy Spirit really strong with the power to get the revelation of the prophecy of Jesus Christ, how to walk this out. Now, does that mean that I'm going to 
all of a sudden be the one that understands all of the book of Revelation? No, nobody understands all of the book of Revelation. Did you ever try to study Revelation? So you look how this guy explains Revelation and then how this guy explains Revelation and this guy. And you might know all of those pastors that are explaining it and they all might be wonderful teachers and and have powerful ministries that are uh, witnessing to the nations. But yet they all have a little different say of how it's all going to unfold. And not any of them are saying it all exactly the same. Why? Because no one knows. Why? Because God doesn't want anybody to know. Why? Because we'd probably mess things up. (laughs) It's called a walk of faith. Look and be ready. Be watching. Now, do we we have uh, uh, somewhat of of an idea? Yeah, this is is what's going to be happening. Um, The enemy's going to be made his footstool. Babylon's going to fall. And Jesus Christ is coming back to set up his kingdom for a thousand years. Now, how all that transpires, we don't know. Well, where's the rapture and all that? Well, we don't know. The earth is going to go through some pretty troubling times. Well, how long is that going to be? How long is the, the great tribulation? Well, it depends on who you talk to. Some people say it's three and a half years, and they'll swear by it. It's three and a half years. I got scripture here to show you. And other people say, no, it's seven. And some people say, well, no, well, the first three and a half years are about the warnings. That's not the wrath of God. The wrath of God, the great tribulation, doesn't happen until the last three and a half years. It depends on who you talk to. So this is, this is the deal. Don't get uptight. However it happens, it happens. Whenever it happens, it happens. But this is what the, we know. The Lord said, watch and be ready, because it could happen at any time. So we just keep doing the same things, preparing with what the Lord's called us to do. And so this revelation was poured out, and I feel what it was. It was a strong prophetic anointing uh, just, to, just to flow with what Jesus Christ, with his kingdom God, calling him back, his rule and reign, on this planet, because soon we're going to get the seventh trump, and the seventh trump is the proclamations, the kingdom of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ, and he shall reign forever. That's the seventh trump. That's the last trump. And at that time, all the mysteries of God are going to be known to all of man. No longer will we have to prophesy the things of God. That's going to be at the time of the final prophecy, because it says at right before the seventh trump, all the mysteries of God, as all the prophets have spoken from old, have come to pass. So at that point, we'll quit prophesying because the manifestation, that's what we're prophesying, is the kingdom of God. Do you know Jesus talked more about the kingdom of God than anything? More than love, more than faith, more than anything, he talked about the kingdom of God. He wanted us to understand what that kingdom's like because he wanted that kingdom to be set up in our heart right now because soon he's going to come back and it's going to be a physical. Everybody's going to see it. You can't deny it. Now it's in us. And so people can argue about it, but every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Whether you decide to do it and you want to make him your Lord, his, our Lord and Master right now, or whether at that time you're forced to your knees because you're in rebellion and you're shaking your fist at God, you don't want to do what God says, then it will not be well for you at that time when Jesus comes back to strike the nations with the word of God and set up his kingdom. Okay. Hopefully I didn't go on too much of a rabbit trail there for you. Everybody follow me with that? Okay, good. Now, we're, we, we are spiritual warriors with, with a prophetic anointing. Uh, September um, 13th, 2015 was our 14-year anniversary. So now, you know, we're looking like, you know, around this same time period, 2015, about what, four years ago? So not quite five, four years ago. And, and it was uh, the eve of the Feast of Trumpets. Our anniversary falls in line with the Feast of Trumpets, not every year, but depending on how that goes to the Jewish calendar. And the Feast of Trumpets, Rosh Hashanah. God gave us a trumpet voice. Now, a trumpet voice from Isaiah 58. You know, the trumpet voice, the big shofar. That's why we blow that sometimes. It's powerful. has a lot of spiritual significance to it. Now, in the Old Testament, why did they have the shofar? Why did they have the trumpets? Well, there, there's, there's different reasons for it, but three main reasons uh, for the, the trumpet, the shofar, first was to warn people. You know, the trumpet was to warn people about God, God needs your attention. You need to deal with your heart. Some things are going to happen. There's going to be a major move, whatever, or there's a battle coming. There's a physical battle coming. So it was to warn people. That was the first thing with the trumpet. The second thing with the trumpet The main usage of it, when they would blow it, was for people to assemble. They wanted people to come together, assemble together, so they could be equipped. Bring them together, assemble them together. They need to be equipped. So they would blow it to assemble and equip and bring people together. 
The third reason for the use of the trumpet was to celebrate. It was like, yes, yeah, celebrate, make some noise, blow the horns, blow the trumpets. Woo, it's all good in Zion. God is good. And that's why the, the uh, Rosh Hashanah, which is the Feast of Trumpets, which is also said Yom Teruah, those three phrases are the uh, Feast of Trumpets. Um, that start, the Feast of Trumpets are the blowing of the trumpets to bring in the new year. That's the Jewish New Year, the Jewish calendar New Year, and that just happened last week. Last Sunday was Rosh Hashanah. It was the Jewish New Year. And they blow the trumpet, celebrate. So it's for celebration and to celebrate what's coming. So this is, this is so cool how all this works out. God, I, I just love God. He's so amazing. I'll, I'll work into that in just a minute, so don't let go of that. Now, on April 6, 2019, so we were given this trumpet voice years ago, a prophetic voice to warn and wake up, to assemble and equip and to celebrate we feel one of the things we were called to do is, is to shout out to the believers that are out there. There are so many believers that they say they're Christian, but they're not going to church. They're not really hooked in. They're not studying the word. They're, they're just kind of, you know, and, they're, and they're, they made the Sabbath all about their own pleasure and their own self and their own relaxation. And so they've, they've kind of defiled the Sabbath. And we feel that the Lord said, I, I want you to call my people out of a defiled Sabbath. And that's part of that trumpet voice. That's the, the warning. That's, hey, get your heart right. You know, the Lord's dealing with some things here. Get your heart right. Come back into the house of God, into the family of God. You know, it's sad that people say, well, I love God, but I don't love the church. I don't, the church is a bunch of hypocrites. Well, the church is the body of Christ. It's the bride of Christ. How, if, how can you say you love God if you don't love his bride? Where's bride? Where's bride? You know, it's like, it's like they've divorced the bride of Christ, but yet still want to be a part of Jesus. Well, you can't divorce the bride and still be with Jesus. Is that making sense? Amen. You know, we need, we need to come back into the tabernacle to worship the Lord. So, in my prayer journal, April 6th, not that long ago, okay, this is, this is uh, 2019 now. Fast, going into the future now, right around now. So April 6th, about five months ago, in my prayer journal, I wrote this down. I felt this. A boldness of righteousness. A boldness for righteousness. And then I also wrote down, I felt the Lord instructed me to write this down. The church has been compromised. And instead of preaching the gospel with boldness, we're afraid of offending everyone and have become spiritual crybabies. Justifying complacency. We appease sin instead of destroying it. Christians are watering down the gospel to make it more appealing, but in reality, they are denying its power. Instead of setting people free, they are left in bondage. So instead of by faith and being bold and releasing the, the power of God, the word of God, to deal with the sin in everybody's life, we just try to appease everybody because we don't want to offend them, and so we water down the power of God so you don't have any bondage-breaking power anymore because you just water down the word so much it doesn't have the, the power of God that was intended when the Lord first gave us this word, and we back off and we're timid and we're not releasing the full authority, the full power of the word of God. We're almost ashamed of the word of God. Oh, you mean to tell me the only way to God is through your Jesus? Come on, are you that prideful? Are you that narrow-minded? Have you ever heard that? I have, but I, I, I would lovingly say, well, you know, um, uh, Jesus really changed my life, and, and I really believe what the Scripture says, and so just giving a testimony of how I've changed, nothing else changed my life the way he did, so he's... He's definitely real, and he's a real figure. It's, he's a historical figure. That's a fact. And I believe what he says when he says that he's the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except through him. So I, I really believe he's, he's the way. What do you believe? And then you respect what they say. It's not to get into an argument, right? We don't want to get into an argument. If you start arguing with people, drop it. We like to discuss Okay, and, 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 and then you have respect for what they say, even if they disagree, because we love people right where they are at. Amen. Even if they see something a little differently, that's okay. Hopefully, we can witness to them with the word of God and with the love of God. And so 
I, I, I wrote that down. Around the same time, I kept, I kept hearing this really strong. Not a shame. Not a shame. Come on. That's what the word says, you know, in, in Romans 1, 16 and 17. Not a shame. Not a shame. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation for all those who believe, for first the Jew and then the Greek, for in it is the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, for as it is written, the just will live by faith. And the Lord kept telling me, Mike, don't be ashamed. Don't back down. Lift up my word. Don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed. And so with that, I just felt so strong. We had these little cards made. You can get these cards. Why don't you get one of these cards in the office? They're like a, a little church card for all of us. And it says, not ashamed. Romans 1, 16 and 17. And it says, I like it because it's, it's just kind of bold. It says, get saved, live righteous, love people, stop demons. Not ashamed. Any questions? Come on. This is how we live the gospel. We're not ashamed. We're not backing down. We love people, but we're stopping demons. <laughs> we're not going to back down, okay? And you can put your, your name on the back, and you might want to put um, your phone number if you want, or, or you might want to put like our service times on the back. I left the back blank so we all can put whatever we want on the back of it. And uh, you know, like I was talking with Daniel, and he said, yeah, put the service times if you're going to leave it someplace for someone. And, and I know sometimes uh, Christians, when they eat, when they're trying to be a good witness to the waitress there or whatever, a good encouraging, not a hindrance or a bother. But you know, uh, just by showing uh, understanding and kindness and stuff, and they think like, well, I'll leave this with my tip. Well, that could be a good idea or that could be a bad idea. If, if you only tip like 10% and you're not that good of a tipper, well, then keep the card in your wallet, please. <laughs> The only thing you witness to the waitress is that you are a Christian cheapie. Now, if you want to give them a 30%, a 40%, 100%, then by all means, be a generous giver. Bless them and say, you were amazing. Your service was fantastic. Uh, you made my day. You made me smile. God bless you. I pray God answers your prayer. And put her little name on there. Notice her name on the name tag. And then put that with your $20, 30 40 $50 tip. And then they're going to get noticed. And then they're going to go, oh, oh, they said that nice stuff about me. What is, ah, oh, this looks cool, not ashamed, huh? Oh, maybe I'll check that church out. Anyways, just a recommendation. <laughs> God is so good. Thank you, Daniel, for that recommendation. See, together we're the body of Christ, right? Right? We all pitch in. We all have our part. So... So from that came the business cards. Also from that came the, the series, The Final Battle. Um, we had a series here um, for about 13 weeks on, on what the final battle is, that we've entered into that final battle. Uh, then that led to the book. We have a book that's going to come out, and I feel this is leading to understanding the power of what that book is going to do. Um, we, we've got a book called The Final Battle, which I had a couple people read the manuscripts on it already just to give us some input and uh, it's a powerful book. It is bold, it is bold, it is bold. And um, in July uh, 28th, 2019, our Sunday message, that was the last message in the series, The Final Battle. We had the, talked about The Final Battle. Very last message was not ashamed. Not ashamed. And it, and it had to do with standing strong, standing on the word. And it included a prayer of boldness from Acts 3, 1 through 10, and Acts 4, 1 through 31. You know, that's the one where the disciples were told not to mention the name of Jesus. Uh, they told them, they said, look, you guys got to shut up about this Jesus. We don't want to hear any more about this. You know, don't, don't, don't teach any more in that name. Teach whatever you want. And then the disciples got a little nervous, but they got together and they said, hey, you know. Well, and then they, they quoted Psalms 2, which was scripture. So they said, okay, let's quote prophecy. So they spoke prophecy, and then they prayed the word of God for power, for boldness to come upon them, and boldness, and it says, for signs and wonders to follow. And then they started doing great, miraculous things. So that's what that's about. That's what they did, and that's what we did. And so that was the time when we wrapped up that, that last message. So we do things by faith. So I said, let's all come up to the altar. So at the end of service, we all came up to the altar, and we said, we're going to do the same thing. So we got that scripture, and we prayed, we released the scripture prophetically about the power and boldness of God, and we sat here, and we took the, the, the word that represented the word of God, this sword, and we sit here, and we strike the nations with the word of God, this region called the thumb, and we prayed, and everybody was kneeling around this altar, and they got a picture of that, and then Carissa, I think it was Carissa, she put it on Facebook, and she took one of the, the, the sentences that kind of summarized that service, and it says, as one, we fight for the glory of Yeshua HaMashiach and for the souls of men. 
And it was powerful. And I saw that on the Facebook. And I thought, oh, this is so cool. I said, I said, can we make a banner of that? And they said, yeah, we can make a banner of that. So I thought, good, let's make a banner of that. And it's in the hallway right across from when you go out today. Make sure you look at it. Right across from the kitchen is that banner with that on there. And I thought, wow, let's lift that banner up. It's the only time that we ever made a banner like that. Now, we've made banners that introduced the series, the teaching series, but never in the middle of it. And took a, and, did, and I thought, wow, this is so cool. So that's out there. And so what happened is then, so let me just keep moving along. And so as you know, uh, I meet with Pastor Johnny um, once a week. And him and I get together because he's the associate pastor. He's the, the praise leader. And his heart and my heart need to be knit together. And out there, what I would recommend out there in TV land for any pastors, you get together every week with your lead worship leader, and you need to be together as one and talk and blend hearts and, and, and see what each other is saying because iron sharpens iron. And so we'll talk about game plans, what's going on, and, and he'll check me, I'll check his heart. We try to keep each other right on track, and we don't want the enemy to come in and cause division, because what a way to cause division in the church is to come in between the associate pastor, who's the worship leader, and the lead pastor. And so he knew Pastor Mike Benson was coming, and he said, you know, I know what Pastor Mike Benson usually preaches about, and it's really good, and the gifts and tongues and all that, but maybe you could contact him and, and he could t talk and teach us about this boldness that he's really had about going out there and evangelizing. And, and uh, he's on Facebook and he's showing all the miraculous things where he's praying for people in Kmart and all these things are happening and people are getting healed. He says, maybe he'll preach that. He says, why don't you contact him? And so I thought, maybe I'll do that. And then I left and I prayed about it and, and the Holy Spirit said, no, no, you don't need to contact him. He knows what to preach about. So I said, okay. So here comes Pastor Mike Benson here, September 15th, just a couple weeks ago. And what does he preach about? Acts 3, 1 through 10, and Acts 4, 1 through 31, and tells about the disciples and how they told them to shut up about Jesus and how they went to pray for boldness. And then they went out and signs and wonders happened. And then at the end of that service, what happened? Signs and wonders and most powerful things happened. Bondages were broken. People were healed. Captives were set free. The miracle working power of God was right here. We prayed it. We believed it. We prophesied it. We spoke it. It came to pass. Hallelujah. And as the body of Christ, we function by faith. I'm telling you, amazing things are coming. This is just a little taste of what God wants to do. Believe. Grab hold of prophecy. Release it. Speak the scripture. Pray. Believe. But it gets better. Wait. There's more. <laughs> it's so good. Wednesday, 925. After allowing some people. This, now, now, we're just talking a week ago. After allowing some people to read the manuscripts for um, the final battle, uh, a couple people uh, came up to me, and they said that, um, you know, well, this is good, but the book, the book is very bold. And, and, you know, that's my personality, so obviously it's going to be bold, and we're called to be bold. And they said, you know, maybe it's too strong. If you're trying to reach some people who are lukewarm in between, um, some Christians that are kind of mediocre or, or they're, you know, whatever, this might be too strong for them. And so I thought, well, I'm going to pray about this, so... I go into prayer, and, and I start praying about this. So I hear in my prayer journal, and I write it down in my prayer journal, and, and I hear the Lord again kind of rebuke me, say, stop appeasing sin. Not ashamed, remember? All things will be shaken. All things will be shaken. And I'm like, oh. And right away I knew exactly. I didn't have to ask the Holy Spirit what he meant by that. I knew what the Holy Spirit meant. He said, listen, he said, you, you don't need another mamby-pamby message. You don't need another watered-down feel-good in this sense for this, for what I want you to do. Those messages are great. But right now with some of those people, they got to have something bold in their face to kind of slap them and shake them and say, whoa, this is what's happening. You need to wake up. And when they read this book, you're going to see, whoa, about the deep state and about the aliens and the gates and what's happening and all these amazing things because it's really interesting. And so hopefully it's just going to, whoa, kind of like shock them and shake them a little bit because there's a shaking that the Holy Spirit, I knew we referred to Hebrews chapter 12, which talks about a shaking where God says he's going to shake everything. He's going to shake everything he can shake. Let me read this so I get it uh, expounded on correctly. And so it says in Hebrews 12, 27 through 28, yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. Now this yet once more indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken God wants to shake some things to remove the things of this earth as the things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. The things that cannot be shaken. What cannot be shaken? The kingdom of God cannot be shaken. 
The kingdom of God cannot be shaken. The ways of this world, oh, it's going to get shook. This culture, it's going to get shook. There's only two kingdoms. There's the kingdom of God and there's the kingdom of Satan. The kingdom of light, the kingdom of darkness. You got your choice. And, and sometimes as Christians, we're holding on and we're more involved in the, in the culture of this world and in the ways of this world and in the things of this world, even though we say we're Christian and we're not really tied into and living the kingdom of God, the kingdom of lightness. And so we, we proclaim to be of this kingdom, but we're living in this kingdom. So when God shakes and he shakes that, the, this, this culture, this realm, this, this, this kingdom of darkness, when that shakes, if we're holding on to that, the Christians are going to suffer loss and they're going to be in fear and they're going to be in panic. But the ones that are in the kingdom of God, no matter what happens around them, all hell can break loose, but it's not going to break loose on them because they're not in the kingdom of hell. They're in the kingdom of heaven. So it's not going to affect them at all. No matter how crazy and bad it gets, it's going to be like, whoa, I'm in the kingdom. This is okay. God, do whatever you got to do. I trust in you. And we're going to shine bright. And people are going to say, aren't you all worried? Aren't you upset? Aren't you panicked? Nope. God's under control. Saw it coming. <laughs> How can I pray for you? <laughs> can I get an amen? amen? All right. God is so good. Now, and so, you know, let, it, let me, I'll, I'll get through this. We're doing this really good. Just got a couple. I'm just going to start reading this in just a minute so I can get through it. But remember last week I studied too, so I'm praying a little bit more. Okay, Lord, I'm getting it. Um, but just one last time, really, is, is the book a little too strong? I don't want to turn anybody off. So one last time, you know, kind of like Gideon. He needed to do the fleece. He did the fleece a couple times. So I said, like, here's another little fleece, God. You know, is, is the book a little too strong? And so that, that morning, I turn on a, a Christian television program. I watch about a half hour of Christian TV every morning. So I don't watch a whole lot of it because I don't have time. And so I, I, I turn on, I'm watching the Jim Baker show. And lo and behold, I told you this last week, but it's so cool. Here's Lance Wilnow. And Lance Wilnow is a very strong prophetic voice. Um, he has um, access to President Trump. And he shares a story about how before President Trump was elected, uh, President Trump called to the evangelicals and he brought them all together. He got some of the evangelical leaders together and he, and he asked them, he said, what do I need to do to get your vote? I want to garner your vote. How do I get the vote of the evangelical Christians? And he had all the leaders there. And so they started giving them input. They said, you know, well, you're a little crass. You're maybe a little too bold. You're picking fights all the time. Maybe you need to be a little more humble. And they're giving them this, this advice. And so they, they get done saying what they get done saying. And Trump kind of like, mm-hmm. And he looks at him and he goes, he goes, you guys are all a bunch of wimps. And that's why Christianity is having the problems that they're having right now. Amen. This is a true story. And, and, and he goes, and he backtracks a little bit and he goes, but, you know, I'm a Christian too. So I'm kind of, you know, I'm kind of at fault as well. And so I said to myself, okay, Lord, I'm getting the message. The book should be bold. I, I got you here, Lord. Okay. So in the last chapter of the book, the very last chapter of the book that we're about to release, um, the last chapter is called Lift the Banner. We are not ashamed. It's going to lift up the banner. This is the answer for all these problems. You know, so we got all these problems and issues that we're going to point out, but then we got a game plan. We got a way how to solve and work through these issues and how to have victory it's called Lift the Banner, We Are Not Ashamed. And in the Bible, the words now, the, in, in the Bible, the two words are, are almost synonymous, are standard, the word standard, and the word banner. They're almost the same. And as we know, banner, it's from the word uh, uh, Jehovah Nisi, and when you lift up the banner, it means God will fight for us. God will fight for us. When you lift up the banner of God, the banner of his word, he will fight for us. Okay, so it has to do with battle. All right. So we're hoping that the book will not only cast down deception uh, over America, allowing people to see the truth, but rally regions together, releasing the power of the gospel and a spirit of boldness with signs and wonders. And so this is our first prophetic book. Now, this is so cool. I got I to gotta explain this really quick. So you got to listen quick. Remember how I said God gave us the trumpet voice, and the first part has three aspects. The first was to, to call out and to warn people, okay, and to caution, to warn, because what's coming? The second part is to assemble and equip, and the third part of the trumpet voice is to celebrate. Well, I always thought I was going to write one book, and I thought the one book that I was going to write is the book I've been writing for over two years, and it's called The Morningstar Authority. And The Morningstar Authority is a book on how to equip people, 
how to understand about the authority, how to understand about the anointing of God, all the miracles that God is doing, all the prophetic things that the Lord is doing. And so I thought, that's going to be my one and only book. I thought, one book, this is good. And then, then all of a sudden, this not ashamed rises up. And, and the final battle and the deception that's on America and Christians are, are gathered into the anti-word of God and they don't even realize it. And, and you, this, this word has to go out. And, and somebody in church said, Pastor, other churches aren't hearing this. They need to hear this. And I thought, well, yeah, I guess we need to write a book. And so we write a book. And in two months, boom, voila, two months, there's a book. And so then the Lord says, this isn't the only other book you're going to write. The Lord said, you're also going to write a book on the Teruah. The Teruah is the great shout. It's the great shout of praise and celebration. He said, it's a trilogy. You're writing three books. And then the Lord showed me just yesterday. Just, I just saw this yesterday. The Lord said, this is why you're writing three books. He says, because you have a trumpet voice. And he said, the first trumpet voice is to call out and warn. That's the final battle. He said, the, the second trump, trumpet voice is to assemble and to teach. He said, that's the morning star authority. And he said, then the third trumpet warning is to celebrate and give me praise. He said, that's the great Teruah shout. I said, wow. God is so good. He is so awesome. But when you send out a book like that, I had one of my friends read this who I really respect. Uh, John Partake, of course, we had, we had like five or six people read it that I really, and I respect all of you guys, but, you know, couldn't give it to everybody, and anyways, it would take too long to get the feedback. And John Partake read it, and he says, I said, well, what do you think? He says, oh, it's awesome, but I think you're picking a fight. <laughs> I said, yeah, I am, with the enemy over this region. So God is so good. And so let me just read this last thing. To wrap this up, this is it, last thing. And so God's going to confirm, right? God's going to confirm the prophetic and, and this article, this, is, this, is a, this isn't even a week old. This is from last Monday. I came across this article, and it just kind of jumped out at me. It's from a prophetic person, Je uh, Jesse Champ, who I've, I've heard of him before. He's a respected prophetic voice. And the name of it is God's Anointed Remnant Will Raise the Standard. Again, what's the standard? A banner. And wh what have we talked about? The Anointed Remnant. That's us, the Anointed God. And this is what he said. Because he says, we've just entered into the Jewish New Year of 5780. It is the year of the mouth. We are getting ready to approach 2020, and I'm declaring this year to be the year of the prophet. We are in the midst of a new prophetic movement. More than that, I dare say, it's a prophetic awakening. We are seeing an emerging generation of prophetic sons and daughters rising into their destinies and calling. It's a new breed, a new prophetic company. And this continues. This is what he had. I didn't make this up. A great shaking. God is rising up a remnant, a company of prophets, even in the midst of a great shaking. The word of God tells us that everything that can be shaken will be shaken. It refers back to the exact same scripture from Hebrews 12. Let us be reminded in these times of shaking that we are part of a kingdom which cannot be moved, Hebrews 12, 8, 28. I heard the Lord say to me more recently, those who survive the shaking will be a voice of this generation. And then I just read another article just, just Saturday, I think it was. And, no, Friday. It was Friday. I read this other article on Friday, and it said that the, the reason why the prophets now are saying that they believe that there's a, a prophetic a uh, strong prophetic spirit going forth because of the mouth. And they said the reason why is because you know how all the Jewish alphabet has the, the different letters and the different numbers have symbols that go with them, and so they have different meaning. And so it's the Jewish year, 5780. And 80, the little symbol that they have for it is a uh, mouth. So that's why they're saying this is now not only just for 5780, but it opens up the next decade of what's going to be coming, and it's a powerful movement of the prophetic of the words of God. God is so good, isn't he? And they said one of the ways that these new prophetic generation are getting the word out is through writing. Isn't that cool? God is so good. All right. Are you excited about what's coming? Yeah. Isn't God amazing? Yeah. All right, let's pray. God is good.